our Congressman Barb Congresswoman Barbara Lee of California, Fernando Amandi, Fernando Amando, Vermont, Fernand Amandi Sr., a retired executive, and his son, A.M. Joy Pal, and pollster Fernand Amandi II. All right, so now that I've gotten everybody's names butchered and destroyed, let me go through and ask the Congresswoman first, what do you make of Donald Trump's uh, switcheroo on Cuba? First, uh, I think that uh, he's showing just how uh, disingenuous he's, he's been uh, by these rollbacks. This has been a 50-year policy in terms of uh, in ensuring that Americans cannot travel freely to Cuba like we can to Vietnam or, or China or anywhere else in the world. Also, he knows good and well that uh, ending the embargo would create more jobs in America, and that rolling this back now really would destroy at least 13,000 jobs, 6.2 billion in, in revenue. And so it's a policy that, uh, you know, President Obama attempted to move forward on because we in Congress still haven't been able to legislatively lift the embargo and lift the travel ban. So he's trying to roll back the, the, the gains that we've made in terms of normal relations with Cuba and trying to set us back 55 years. And it doesn't make sense. And I hope the American people really uh, resist this uh, move. And Fernand Amandi Sr., we're going to start with Fernand Sr. on this. Why shouldn't Americans um, be free to travel um, to Cuba if Americans can travel, you know, to North Korea? I mean, Americans get on a plane to go to Iran if, if they want to. Why shouldn't Americans be free to travel to Cuba? No, Americans should be free to travel anywhere in the world and will continue to be able to travel to Cuba. But let me try and put this in context, in nonpartisan context. This is what's in the interest of the American people and what is in the interest of the Cuban people. To give credit where credit is due, President Obama reached out to the Cuban regime in an effort to open up a basically paralyzed relationship over 55 years with noble intentions. And he tried. President Trump comes in, looks at it, and decides that this is not as we expected it to be. The fact is that the Cuban government did not react to the unilateral concessions that the U.S. government granted. They continue to meddle extensively in Venezuela, creating a debacle in that poor country. They, can, they increase the repression in, Vene in, in Cuba. And, and, and so you wonder, why not reset the policy? The fact is that the president did not uh, eliminate President Obama's good elements of the policy, many of them, in fact, most of them, remain in place. What is the main point of the policy is that the direct relationship, the direct funding, the direct business with the Cuban regime, the oppressive regime for 58 years, is no longer uh, allowed. The policy, in turn, turns to the Cuban people. Let's engage the Cuban people directly. Pretty much what I think President Obama really tried to do but couldn't. Let's give President Trump credit and a chance to engage the Cuban people and stop funding this repressive, oppressive regime for 58 years. Well, That's the right thing to do for our country. It is the right thing to do for the Cuban people. We applaud. President Trump's decision. Let me go to uh, Fernand Jr. Um, the Fernand, and so you know, the, the, it's a lot of complicated. There are a lot of complications here, right? So you have um, the estimates from Engage Cuba saying that um, this policy switch would cost 6.6 .6 billion dollars over Trump's first term, that it would cost 12,295 jobs, but more sort of directly. I mean, I've, I've, I've been to Cuba. The thing you hear most when people will talk to you off the record, and by the way, it is a, clearly an authoritarian country because people can't just talk to you openly and freely. It's pretty clear that they can't. But when they do get you, and you can get them alone and they're one-on-one, -on -one, one of the things that they will often say is, we really want to make money. We'd rather make money, and that the only way to really make money is through the tourism industry, by being a waiter or by being in that industry where you can make tip income. Why is it um, a better idea to sort of withdraw that kind of opportunity for people to make Airbnb income or tip income by making it harder again for Americans to travel to Cuba? 
Well, I'm not, I'm not sure it is, Joy, and I think that's where uh, I part a little bit of company with my dad in ascribing the good faith intentions to President Trump. Because at the, at the end of the matter, number one, like Congresswoman Lee says, he in no way canceled the Obama policy. This was a slight alteration, so I think there's some disingenuousness there. And I think what it ends up doing more than anything else, this is the tragedy about the new alteration is, once again, it gives that Castro regime, that authoritarian that all of us agree exists an excuse on which to blame the lack of progress. What the Obama policy did was eliminate all of the excuses. And Joy, we know that a successful con man like the Castros utilize the hustle of blaming someone, the blame game. And by now doing this action, they can blame the United States again for an aggressive posture when before they were accountable for their totalitarian actions. And that's why I think at the end of the day, as tragic as it is, this policy change, this policy alteration will not change the fundamental dynamics of the 58-year repression of the Cuban people. I think we were on a closer path to that happening with the previous approach. Now, these con men in Cuba have another excuse with which to blame. Yeah, and very quickly, Congresswoman Lee, your colleague Marco Rubio on the Senate, on the Senate side, uh, seems to have gotten something, and uh, also uh, Congressman Diaz-Blart, my former congressman in Miami, they went in and had a meeting with Donald Trump. Is this what they got um, in exchange for a friendlier relationship with the White House? Probably so, Joy, but let, let me just say a couple of things. We have bipartisan support in Congress to lift the embargo and to lift the travel ban. There are only a few members of Congress holding this policy hostage. I co-chair the Cuba Working Group. We have 12 Republicans and, and 12 Democrats on that working group. We're working together to try to make sure that we do not go back 55 years, but rather uh, move forward. It does make sense. 65% of the public want to travel yeah. to Cuba freely. And and in fact, 63% of Cuban Americans in Miami-Dade County believe that this policy is a failed policy and we should move forward. Right, so it doesn't make any sense. We're, we're almost out of time, but I want to give Fernand Sr. a chance to respond. Do you do, What about just lifting the embargo and just having openness and having American ideas shared uh, with Cubans directly? Well, the embargo at this point is American law, and we are a country of laws. The president stated it very clearly. Here's what we expect the Cuban regime liberate political prisoners, allow free expression, allow oh, multi-party well, you know politics in the country, yep. and have supervised elections instead of continuing to be a tyrant for 55 years. Well, is that not an American principle? Well, we, I want to have this debate again. I'm going to have to have you all back, but I can see the next host is actually standing in the room. I have to get off the air, so I'm going to let you guys go. Uh, thank you very much to Congresswoman Barbara Lee and Fernand Amandi's senior and junior, both